Hi, and welcome to the Overeaters Anonymous uh, Recovery and Relapse meeting. It is the 13th of April, 2021. My name is Rita Q. I'm a recovering compulsive overeater. And today I am absolutely delighted to welcome mm -hmm. Janet B from New Jersey. Janet B has spent her first six and a half years in OA binging and purging, and then she, which got worse until finally God launched a search, search and rescue mission. And she has now been abstinent for 37 and a half years. So Jana, I will let you explain just how you did that. Take it away. Hi, good morning or good afternoon over there. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as Rita said, I'm Janet B. I'm from New Jersey. I've recovered from compulsive eating and bulimia. Um, this is a talk I had done before, 17 pitfalls that lead to relapse because I only have three minutes, I've condensed it to my top 10. Um, and I'll talk New Jersey, which means I'll talk really fast. So um, I do wanna talk about pitfalls in recovery, things that lead us to relapse. Before I do, I'll tell you a little bit about me, more important about God who launched his search and rescue mission for me. Um, I first came into OA when I was in high school, already a full-blown compulsive eater. I stole food, I stole money for food, and at my worst, I was binging and throwing up six times a day. I actually had to have my esophagus surgically retightened because of the abuse that I heaped on it. Um, I was a compulsive liar. I made up crazy stories, including cutting myself with a razor, pretending I was mugged or raped, going to the hospital for a fake rape exam, walking the streets of New York with my rent money at two in the morning because I had to get food. Um, and I continued acting this way and I continued binging and purging for my first six and a half years in OA, even though I was doing what I was told. Um, after six and a half years in OA, I was introduced to the 12 steps. Someone was at a meeting and she held up a big book and she said, I haven't binged in a year. And I just went up to her and I said, tell me what you did, I'll do anything. And that's when I was introduced to the 12 steps and to the God who I believe um, spent six days creating the world, took a day off to rest, and then spends the rest of eternity launching search and rescue missions for us addicts. So um, again, I surrendered my life to this God. I committed to working these 12 steps. And once I did, it was like a hand reached into my soul and yanked up the obsession. And by his grace, I've been in recovery over 37 years. And in that time, I've learned something about relapse, what can cause it and what to do to get out of it. So let's dive in. Um, there's a common misconception that relapse is a part of recovery and that's not true. Or sometimes what we call relapse is just non-recovery. That was my first six and a half years. I just was in non-recovery. In my first six and a half years, I never got more than two weeks of abstinence. Normally, I couldn't make it a lunch. Um, I couldn't do it. Um, Big Book says on page 120 that it's infinitely better to have no relapse, as has been the case with many. So I guess a real definition of relapse would be that we're in recovery, and then we're not. So what happens to cause us to backslide? So as I said, I've identified 17 things in the big book but, um, because of time constraints, I've got my top 10 here. So my top 10 pitfalls that lead to, lead to relapse. One, not moving ahead quickly in the steps. Why is it so important to move ahead quickly in the steps? Remember, the big book says my problem is lack of power. And I'm guessing that some of you had the experience that I did, going into an OA meeting saying, I know I'm powerless over food. I know my life is unmanageable, help. And then being handed a food plan and told to stick to it. Well, that would be like going to an oncologist and being shown a scan of my lungs and the doctor saying, see that spot? That proves you have cancer. You're powerless over this cancer and your life is unmanageable. Now make your cancer cells stop multiplying. Well, of course I couldn't do that. And I couldn't stop eating food compulsively because my problem wasn't lack of knowledge about how to eat healthy or lack of knowing what my binge foods were or lack of desire. 
My problem was lack of power. And the book tells us on page 46, our first infusion of power comes at step two. As soon as we admit the possible existence of God, we begin to be possessed of a new sense of power. That's what I need, right? Power and direction. Here's the caveat, provided we take other simple steps. So at step two, we get enough power, get us to step three, where we're we are told that new power flows in. And at step five, we get enough power that feeling that the drink, or for us, the food problem has disappeared, will often come strongly. By the time we finish our amends, we're told that God has placed us in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. protected. Um, so delaying the steps is delaying the miracle of God's protection. The only step we're allowed to delay is step five, if there isn't a suitable person around to hear. Second pitfall, dishonesty. Um, page 58 tells us that the program requ requires that we develop a manner of living built on rigorous honesty. That means no cheating on taxes, no cheating on husbands, no lying, no stealing. Why? Why is it important that I be honest? Well, first, dishonesty creates fear and tension, and that makes for more drinking. That's on page 73. And second, and more important, whenever I lie, I'm either trying to get something that I want or to avoid consequences that I don't want. And what that boils down to is that I'm playing God, trying to arrange things to get what I want. If I'm being dishonest, I may, may as well take a big magic marker and write the words, keep out God across my heart because I'm really telling God that I don't trust his way and I'd rather do it my way. And we all know what happens then. Um, if I tell God to keep out, he honors me. It's, this honesty is so important. The writers of the book on page 146, when they're talking to the employer of a man who's trying to recover, says, when his wife next calls saying he is sick, you might jump to the conclusion he is drunk. If he is and is still trying to recover, he'll tell you about it, even if it means the loss of his job. Or he knows he must be honest if he would live at all. So they're telling us no matter what the consequences, we have to be honest. Early in recovery, I had a job interview and I had been fired from my previous job. And they asked me at the interview, what happened at your last job? And I, I lied and I said, I quit. And I made something up. And then I went home and realized, oh, I made a commitment to be rigorously honest. And that's the most important thing. But I called the employer back up and said, I was not honest with you. I left my last job because I was fired. Because I knew if I was dishonest, I would end up binging. And what good would any job be? I would lose it. And um, by the way, I did get that job anyway. God honored my attempts to find him. Fall number three, not enough work and self-sacrifice for others. Um, in the full story on page 14, it says how to perfect and enlarge our spiritual life. Now, I would have thought it would say we perfect and enlarge our spiritual life through prayer and meditation, but we're told that the way is through work and self-sacrifice for others. Self-sacrifice by definition requires that we give something up for the welfare of another person. How much self-sacrifice do I need to do? Well, page 97 tells me I have to give up sleep, have my fun time and my work time interrupted. It costs money. It involves going to hospitals, sometimes having people stay at our homes for a while. It says a drunk may smash the furniture in your home or burn a mattress. You may have to fight with him if he is violent. It may involve call, calling police or doctors. So basically, my life shouldn't be as easy breezy as it would be if I weren't working this program. I should not be able to watch as much television as I want, have as much downtime as I want. A good chunk of my spare time is spent helping others. 
Me personally, I took an hour and a half off of work this morning to come be here. This is part of my self-sacrifice for others. Um, number four, not working hard enough or fast enough on our fourth step. Um, we already talked about progressing quickly in the steps, but the big book uses particularly strong language when it comes to working on our fourth step. It tells us that we need to be launched on a course of vigorous action. And it promises that our third step would have no permanent effect. Right. Recovery can be permanent. But it won't have permanent effect unless followed at once with a strenuous effort to resolve our resentment. The big book is very specific in mentioning this as a pitfall. It says when harboring resentment, being a safe place for my resentments to dock, I shut myself off from the sunlight of the spirit. Insanity of food returns and I'll binge again. I can't be a safe harbor for resentment. I need to resolve them quickly. Remember, our only solution is being protected by God. Harboring resentment shuts the door on him so that he can't come in and protect me. So let's turn off that Netflix and get those resentment inventories done when it's time. Um, number five, not living up to our sex ideal or harming others. Page 70 is one of the places where we're told that if we engage in a certain behavior, we are sure get drunk. And that behavior is falling short of our sex ideal. The big book is really clear here that if we fall down on our sex ideal and continue to harm others, we're quite sure to drink. I don't think this is limited to a sex ideal. I think the main point is harming others. So I feel comfortable in saying that the pitfall here is that if I continue to harm others without feeling sorry for it, I'll binge again. Um, I mentioned that I used to pretend that I was a victim of a mugging or a rape. When I was in college, I told my boyfriend who was in a rigorous program of study at an Ivy League school that I'd been raped so he would spend time taking care of me. I had no remorse over doing this, never considered how I was harming him. And of course, I kept binging. Number six letting up on our spiritual program of action and resting on our laurels. We're headed for trouble if we do. On page 85, we're told, every day is a day when we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. And this pitfall applies to people who finish the first nine steps and try to coast. The big book is really clear that I need to keep doing steps 10, 11, and 12. In step 10, we clear away the wreckage of the day so that we can hear from God in step 11. How crazy is that? We get to hear from God. And then in step 12, we help others and we continue to practice these principles in all our affairs. I have to continue practicing honesty, unselfishness, self-sacrifice, and all the other principles in the book. And this includes repairing the damage immediately if I'm considerate. So on page 99 of the book, it tells us that if we don't repair the damage immediately, we may pay the penalty by a spree. I would do things like if I felt I was overly harsh on my daughter, for instance, I would do one of her chores for her. I would do something to make it up. By being overly harsh, I caused her stress. So the amend isn't just to say, I'm sorry. Yes, of course I do that. But I do something to take stress out of her life, like do a chore for her. Number seven, not working intensively with other compulsive eaters. Working with others gives us immunity. I think that's the only place in the big book, at least the text section, where we're promised immunity. The illness of compulsive eating can't touch us. We're protected by God. I love that word immunity. Of course, we all think about it now with the virus, right? We get a vaccine and we have immunity against COVID. Or I think of um, here in America, there, I don't know if you have it over in the UK, a show called Law and Order. Yes, you've got it there. Where um, And there's these couple episodes where there's a diplomat from a foreign country. He comes to New York, commits a crime, 
the cops can't touch him because he has diplomatic immunity. He's protected. And I think also a best way to describe this protection we get, I think of like in the old days, kings and they had the serfs who worked their land and it was the serfs job to serve the king. And in response to that, the king would protect them. So as long as I'm on the king's land, I'm protected. And when the invading army attacks, king, you know, sends past the trumpet, drawbridges go up. And if I'm on that land, I am protected. If I wander off that land in self-will and an army comes to attack, king still raises the drawbridges, but I'm not there to be protected. It's not that the king stopped loving me, stopped being willing to protect me, I left. I need to stay in a state of protection. And that's getting through the steps and working with others. Pitfall eight, not knowing my own personal temptations and limitations. It's important to know where we can't go either because we're too early on in our recovery and then we really shouldn't be going many places at all except work, meetings and to essential things or we're just spiritually shaky that day. In this case, we're told to work with another compulsive eater or if we're new in recovery, we find a way to be useful and practice self-sacrifice instead of going to places of temptation. A big temptation happens while traveling. On page 162, it's recommended that we go to meetings while away in order to, to lend a hand and at the same time, avoid certain alluring distractions of the road. And I always tell my sponsees, be careful. A large percentage of relapses happen when people go on vacation. So if possible, we avoid vacations till we're through the steps. If we can't avoid it, we work with our sponsors to determine how to handle it. Number nine, not resigning from the debating society. Um, I'm a lawyer by trade, so debating society was my fun time. Um, but I don't have to be right about everything or many things anymore. The big book says we've stopped fighting anybody or anything. We have to. The two places right now where it's easy to debate are politics and food plans. Unless the food plan is mine or my sponsees, it's none of my business. So whenever I'm at a meeting and I take questions, I say I'll, I'll talk about anything, but not food plan. I've no... I guess I won't talk about politics either. I don't need to be a member of the debating society anymore. And number 10, idolatry. Now, this is not mentioned specifically in the big book. But I believe it's implied all throughout. The definition of idolatry is putting a person, place, or thing ahead of God. Page 55 tells us that we can block the fundamental idea of God that's in everyone calamity, um, and worship of other things. Those other things are our idols. So an example, one, um, making an idol out of our sponsors. We know we're doing this if we're not being honest with our sponsors. Often it's fear of being dropped, fear of our sponsor reprimanding us, fear of our sponsor not liking us anymore, how is that making an idol out of a sponsor? Remember, sponsor has zero power. Get me abstinent. A sponsor's numero uno job is to help the sponsee get a relationship with God. So if I'm not telling my sponsor the truth, it's like me going to the doctor and not telling him that a precancerous mole has grown back. My sponsor's there to help me and can't do it if I'm dishonest with her. I'm better off without a sponsor and honest than with a sponsor and being dishonest because God absolutely won't work where there's dishonesty. Remember, when we're dishonest, we are essentially telling God to keep out. I've heard it jokingly said, in such cases, a sponsor can build a little altar with the sponsor's picture and put candles and incense around it because they're turning their sponsor into an idol. Um, we can identify our idols filling in the blank for this sentence. I won't be happy 
unless and the unless is my idol unless i get a promotion unless i get married unless i earn x amount of money the biggest idols i've had to work through have had to do with my children i won't be happy unless my children dot 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 you know go to church um don't sleep till 3 p.m every day um whatever it is my kids are 19 now and i've pretty much learn to let go of most of them, but that has been a hard one. I won't be happy unless. I've had to surrender lots of unlesses. This is idolatry. And it's basically kicking God off the throne and putting that person, place, or thing on the throne. Solution to idolatry is to treat it like any other defect, to admit it, to surrender it, ask God's forgiveness, and to put God back on the throne. How to get out of relapse and how to help sponsees get out of relapse. I've spoken about 10 pitfalls that lead to relapse and I've tried to identify some of the causes of relapse. I want to say a few things about what to do to get out of relapse. The goal is to identify our pitfalls so that we can get reconnected with God because only he can bring us out of it. It's my opinion and people wiser than I am may disagree it's my opinion, based on my reading of the big book, that a sponsor should not automatically drop a sponsee if the sponsee eats compulsively. I say this based on three passages of the big book. There's more than three, but in the interest of time, I'll just bring up three right now. Um, in the forward to the second edition, it says that 25% of early AAs sobered up after some relapse. Clearly, they weren't just left on their own. Number two, in chapter three, it talks about Jim and how he got drunk half a dozen times in rapid succession. The text says that on each occasion we worked with him, reviewing carefully what happened. I know some people look at this passage and say, we worked with him. That means someone else can work with him. It doesn't have to be me. Again, wiser people may disagree. But I don't think it means that. If I'm someone's sponsor, I already know their history, weaknesses, their best ways to reach them. Plus, there's a relationship there, hopefully one of love, trust, and friendship. If one of my sponsees relapses, hopefully I'll be in a better position to help her than someone she's never spoken to. And the third passage is on page 179, Dr. Bob's Nightmare. Dr. Bob tells how he met Bill Wilson, who worked hard with him, and Bob stopped drinking for three weeks. And Bob went on a huge binge. Well, Bill didn't just say, Bob, gosh, I put three weeks in with you. I worked really hard and you blew it. So thanks for keeping me sober by letting me work with you. Look, you need to find someone else. Bill did not do that. He helped him. Because he took him home, he put him to bed, and he worked with him. And thank God, because if he hadn't, None of us might not be here today. Okay, I said that a sponsor shouldn't automatically drop a sponsee if she relapses. Here's a good way to decide. I would ask if the sponsee is doing everything I've told her to do. I'm not talking about sticking to a food plan because we're powerless to do that. Is she doing everything else? So for instance, I require that all my sponsees spend at least 30 minutes every morning with God. Because the only way to get a relationship with someone is to spend time with them. I require them to make a certain amount of phone calls, um, to do a lot of work in the book, to go to meetings, things like that. If they're unwilling to do that, then I feel no compunction about dropping them. Not because they're bad, we're not bad, we're, we have an illness, but because page 58 tells me that this program doesn't work for people who aren't willing to go to any length. So if someone isn't willing to go to any length, I point to page 58 and say, I'm not allowed to sponsor you. I'm only allowed to sponsor people who are willing to go to any length. If she is willing to go to any length and she's been doing what I asked. I first ask if there's any dishonesty in her life. And if there is, she needs to clean it up. 
Then I'll ask her to review the pitfalls. I have a recording of myself listing the 17 pitfalls and I ask her to review them and figure out what pit did you fall into? Um, was there a lack of strenuous effort on one of your steps? Are you working hard at self-sacrifice? Dr. Bob said people who relapse are those who stop having a morning quiet time. And she stopped that. Is there an amend she hasn't made? Is there a step she feels she hasn't gone through thoroughly. And once she does that, and I generally say, take a day and review it all. And I'll review it with her and encourage her to redouble her spiritual activity, work extra hard in her relationship with God, her usefulness to others, and in whatever area she stumbled. I'd like to mention two things that, again, in my opinion, don't cause relapse. First is circumstance. I'm sure we've all heard people say, or been guilty of saying ourselves, I relapsed because dot, dot, dot. And the dot, dot, dot is a circumstance. My lousy boss. Five minutes. Okay. My lousy boss, my annoying kid, my manipulative mother-in-law. By the way, my boss is great. My kids are wonderful. And my mother-in-law never met her. I understand she was a lovely lady. She died before I got married. I digress. In any case, circumstances are never cause. In a brilliant formula on page 68 of our book, we are told that we are in the world to play the role that he had assigned. Just to the extent that we do as we think God would have us and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity? If I don't have serenity, even in the midst of calamity, even in the midst of hard circumstances, I'm either not doing what I think God would have me, not surrendering, or I'm not humbly relying on him, not trusting. Circumstances never the cause of relapse. The other thing, sometimes people will say, well, I relapsed because I accidentally ate a trigger food. Key word here is accidentally, as in an honest mistake. I used to drink diet soda, I would drink diet Sprite, and one time I accidentally drank a whole can of regular Sprite by accident. They look alike, and I didn't realize it until I was done. It's like, oh crap, I just drank a whole can of regular soda. You know what, I went and I told my sponsor, and then I just concentrated on what the next right thing was to do. Remember, our solution is that we are protected by God. What kind of God would withdraw his protection, kick me out of his protected land because of an honest mistake? If we're being dishonest with our food, and eating something we know leads us to obsession or compulsion, then the issue isn't the food, the issue is dishonesty. Finally, the big book explains exactly how to prevent another relapse on page 120. If a repetition is to be prevented, Place the problem along with everything else in God's hand. We examine all the areas where we're doing the program our own way and begin to do it his way. We make sure we're being honest. We're living up to our ideals. We're clearing up our resentments and fears, making amends quickly when we harm others, spending enough time in prayer and meditation so that we're on the continuous end of God's loving, never ceasing power and that we're helping others to find and fall in love with this great, majestic, wonderful God who supplies us with all the power and protection that we need. And guys, that's just his opening act. If a repetition is to be prevented, place the problem along with everything else in God's hand. I am struck by the awesomeness in those words. Place the problem and everything else in God's hands God must have some pretty big hands to take my problems, your problems, all our problems, and he does. He is big enough to solve all our problems, including, of course, our food problem. So sum up, the antidote to relapse and the key to ongoing recovery can be found on page 59. There is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. May we all find him now. And with that, I pass. Janet, thank you so much. That was wonderful. We are just going to stop the recording now.